they want to know what do you do when you're having a meltdown or tantrums in front of strangers when your friends or assistants aren't there to assist you. And this is somebody who's written in to us before um, mm. that sometimes feels overwhelmed and, and doesn't feel the ability to be able to stop it when it's happening, but is aware enough to be able to say, I had a meltdown today. Right, right. And that's really important. And, uh, you know, I mean, for, first of all, from a behaviorist perspective, we start with just saying, okay, what's the function of the behavior? So, you know, you're having a meltdown. Uh, what is that? What, what do you think is causing that? Is it being in, with the strangers or is it something that occurs in the conversation with those strangers or is it a feeling that you have uh, in social settings, whatever it is? Um, you really have to identify what is causing you to behave that way or to lose control. Um, the reason you have to identify that is that once we know the reason, our intervention is based on that reason. For instance, if it's being in the uh, midst of strangers in a social setting, uh, perhaps you need to gradually uh, acclimate yourself to that. So perhaps you have to shape your, we have to set up a shaping procedure so that you are gradually exposing yourself to being among strangers in a social setting in a way that doesn't make you anxious. If it's, let's say, um, some particular thing that's occurring in the conversation, then it would be important to know what that is so that we can do the intervention based on that. A lot of times, you know, this would be similar to, regardless of what the content is, it's similar to children in, let's say, classroom settings when they have a tan tantrum, um, and how do we try to deal with that? How do we intervene? Really, it has a lot to do with what the child is experiencing. So it's kind of, you know, what are you experiencing at that moment? Are you uh, afraid that you're going to fail? Are you uh, just overwhelmed from the social or, or noise or whatever um, stimulation around you? Uh, are you uh, just not able to pay attention? You know, it could be a multitude of different things, and whichever one of those it is, it, there's sort of a different intervention for it. Um, so, and all of those interventions are are based in the idea that you ha will gradually expose yourself to the type of situation. So, let's say. Uh, let's say it's the noise level or the number of people around you, then of course you'd want to gradually over the course of a month practice exposure to higher and higher levels of noise. Uh, let's say it's, um, you know, just fearing not having an assistant or a friend with you. Well, then we have to gradually make you more confident in being situ in situations where you don't have an assistant or a friend. So uh, it's just, uh, or let's say you're distracted and you're not able to pay attention to what's going on. I mean, each of these has sort of a different way to handle it. And that's really what we have to do is kind of first identify what's causing it and always the behavior is, deter the intervention to help a behavior has to do with uh, what's actually causing it. Yeah. Now, you know, just off the top of my head, it would be very useful for you to learn uh, breathing exercises and since you're able to identify the timing of the sort of the, the the stimulus that sets you off is in those in front of strangers or whatever it is but what the, the th when you identify the thing that's about to get you upset then it's important to be able to just have a closing statement or a break statement something like um, sorry guys I need a break and just walk away, calm down, and generally, to be honest with you, it, it will take about 30 minutes for you to actually calm down enough to be able to re-engage. Now, that's the most basic of, of interventions. Again, if the content of the conversation is too overwhelming or disturbing, then that's sort of more, of, more cognitive of the matter, and we'd have to do other interventions as well. Yeah. I find myself thinking about a really good friend of yours, Dr. Stephen Shore, mm -hmm. that um, the first time I got to interview him, he talked about the baseball hat that he's known for wearing everywhere. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, this is a gentleman who is a college professor at a renowned university mm -hmm. and on the autism spectrum and travels all over the world and mm -hmm. does all kinds of things and, you know, has found the way to have his life work in a certain, mm -hmm. in a certain way. But he said, I wear this baseball hat 
because I can't be any place where there are lights above shining down on my eyes. I I can't handle it. Mm -hmm. I can't think. I can't concentrate. And eventually I will melt down Mm -hmm. because I can't handle the stress. And he says, so I put a baseball hat on and I'm good to go. Right. And, and I, I remember hearing him say that and saying, you know, it's so often we don't give ourselves permission to make a small adjustment like that that can make right. a world of difference. Absolutely right. But what if you think about what that took for him to get to that moment, he had to acknowledge that he had an issue. Right. He had to identify what the issue was. And then he had to think through and go, how can I fix this so this doesn't have to hold me back? And he said, I, I wouldn't have been able to teach college. I wouldn't have been able to go and speak to the people that I've spoken to if I hadn't thought I can just put on a baseball hat and it's Absolutely. okay. And, and you know, Sharon, on that it's really interesting because there are so many things like that that we just, it's, I guess it's acceptable to think that we have some deficit that we're willing to fix. For instance, um, you know, glasses, contact right. lenses or glasses, you know, it, 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 it's not seen as a weakness right. if you actually realize, go to a doctor and realize your vision is failing and you need to wear corrective lenses of some type. So that's just a given. Yeah. And, and the example with Stephen is exactly the same thing. There's, a, there's something in the stimulus that he's not able to, in the environmental uh, stimuli that he's not able to acclimate to. So he has to do something to fix that. It's just, you know, I can't see without my lenses, so I have to put my lenses in. Or um, there are people, often I hear uh, parents will tell me that my child overreacts when, or reacts heavily when there's sounds. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, why don't you just give your child like Bose Right. noise cancelling headphones and let him or her choose when to use them. Yeah. You will see often um, teenagers, for instance, who are like very shy or getting to that very awkward stage of just being uncomfortable in their own skin. And it's not infrequent to see them have headphones around their shoulders and a hoodie so that they can actually put the headphones on, put the hoodie up and shut themselves out of everything. And that's it's totally fine. It's yeah. acceptable because um, we don't think too much about it because they all do it, right? Yeah. So why is it not okay for our for our individuals who actually are more sensitive to yeah. the environmental stimuli to be able to do similar things like that? Yeah. Absolutely, it's it's completely appropriate. Now, in addition to that, what's interesting is, of course, Stephen's tactic is very useful because it actually does block light. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is you can actually use various objects like a hat or a bracelet or a ring or whatever for other purposes. So that it's not even really serving a purpose, but it has been classically conditioned mm-hmm. to produce a sense of peace or calm. Yeah. In fact, if you think about it, a lot of the jewelry that we tend to wear, and this is like kind of going back to forever, jewelry ends up having that type of a thing. Like a lot of people will wear a ring that was passed on by their grandmother to their mother to their whatever. And that actually is, is, we believe in it having a positive omen or it has a sense, it produces Mm -hmm. a sense of safety and and reduces anxiety. It is essentially the same exact thing Mm -hmm. as a security blanket that you have when you're two years old, for instance, or a stuffed animal that you carry around. So, you know, all of those things are possible and and we can use a lot of those things to help ourselves in public situations where we feel uncomfortable. Wonderful. So hopefully uh, that's some good information and let us know how you're doing. Uh, Somebody wrote in and said, looking for some advice on sibling aggression. I have a six-year-old grandson with autism that will start laughing and then push his one-year-old brother down to the floor. He will then just laugh at you when you try to correct him. Any thoughts? And they wrote, worried for the baby. Right. This is a very difficult situation, of course. So, you know, the six-year-old just doesn't really have the understanding that by pushing the baby down, they might produce harm. So it's important to remember that because you can, simply because I want to make sure the six-year-old isn't blamed because they just don't understand the issue of harm. Um, Having said that, of course, it is our duty to protect the baby. So the only way that this can actually occur, this whole thing can be fixed, is that the behavior has to be blocked. We cannot allow the six-year-old to be in the presence of the baby alone. It's really that simple. 
Um, if the six-year-old and the baby are in the same room, an adult has to be there and has to be able to watch and protect the baby before the six-year-old gets to the baby. Now, the, the six-year-old is doing this possibly, I'm reading this and thinking most likely because of the attention that they receive when he does this. So he will push the baby, an adult will most likely go over there and try to like reprimand him or say, oh no, don't do that. The baby cries, all of this happens. And the six-year-old gets um, a few things. He gets attention because someone is giving him attention at that moment. Negative or positive attention is all the same. It doesn't matter. Um, and secondly, he is maybe perhaps experiencing a little bit of jealousy due to the fact that he has to share his attention with the baby. And by doing this, of course, he now gets the attention back. And so the, the behavior has to be blocked. It has to be prevented. And quite honestly, the six-year-old has to be engaged with, in other things um, so that he's getting attention and for doing more positive things. A lot of times kids will do negative behaviors just because they seek out the attention. They try to get focus on themselves. And they manage to by doing these types of things, you know. So uh, you can't ignore this behavior that because obviously the baby would get hurt. You have to definitely... Uh, completely block the behavior and if the behavior should occur it's important to just take the baby and uh, to safety and protect the baby but not engage with the six-year-old um, you know giving a, a speech to the six-year-old or saying oh you shouldn't do that reprimand that sort of thing is attention and when a behavior is maintained by attention then you want to make sure you're not giving attention to it. Now, I'm just making assumptions based on what I read that this behavior would potentially be based on attention. It could be other things as well. For instance, the six-year-old might want a toy that the baby has or something like that, and that those are dealt with differently. But regardless, uh, it the behavior just needs to be blocked. The six-year-old is clearly not at the, doesn't have the capacity right now to understand what they're doing is harmful. And I, and I would also say, too, if you have an opportunity to watch on the A word, there's a whole, um, I think there's two different segments on the A word where Jack Riley, when his sister was about one, had some jealousy issues and was being mean to little Gracie. Right. right. And you get to see the therapist intervening and they, um, not only did they ha make sure that he couldn't, but they set up a reward schedule for every time he did something nice for his sister. That's and a great turned, idea too. And turn on, you know, like the party lights That's a every very time good something. Idea, right. And it was on a, they, it was on a board and he got points right. for every right. time and he could, and, and he would say, I was nice to the baby and all of that right. stuff. And you can watch that on the A word. It has its very own channel. That's a Check really that good out. idea too. So here we're actually reinforcing a behavior that is contra con contrary to um, the the pushing behavior. So if he's able to do something nice for the baby, maybe he gets a reward. Yeah. Or even if he is able to like, you know, move the baby around in a stroller or any kind of positive interaction could be rewarded. Yeah, and they and they show you the whole thing on the A-word, so I encourage you to check that out. Uh, our next okay. question came in over the weekend. Hi, my question is for Dr. Doreen. Our son was recently evaluated but did not meet ASD criteria. Instead, he was labeled with social pragmatic disorder. He is almost three and a half, and his main symptom, symptoms are scripting, echolalia, repetitive play, and not yet making conversation. He is very smart and has a large vocabulary, but only uses it to get his needs met. My question is, is speech therapy going to be enough? I've scheduled a second opinion, but have to wait until mid-February. I also enrolled him in preschool starting this January, hoping that they will help with social skills somewhat. We are in Wisconsin and had our first evaluation with a Denver model group, but our next one is with WEEP which is ABA based. Do you know if they're good? If not, would we do better with remote through card? And thank you so much, you were amazing. I will add also that this parent also wrote in additional information that I was able to share with Dr. Grambichet that we won't necessarily go into, but might refer to. Um, so that's why we have more information because they wrote more extensively. Right, so um, from my perspective, so first of all, it's difficult for me because scripting and echolalia are different things. So I kind of don't know which one. It helps me to identify what his real level is. 
Scripting is when you repeat things that you've heard, so it's kind of like a delay decalalia type thing, but you, you repeat them from scripts like on, in movies and so on. Echolalia is generally a very basic language problem, which is just repeating everything you hear. Scripting tends to be more the child trying to use things that they've heard from, let's say, TV in their real life, and it's a higher level problem than echolalia. So assuming that, and repetitive play um, <clears throat> is also one of those things that really has many different levels. Like, uh, so <clears throat> a lot of normal play is repetitive in nature to begin with. So it's a little difficult for me in my mind to place actually where your child is, but I'm really glad that you've scheduled a second opinion because that's what I would do. The social pragmatic disorder is the new diagnosis that just came out with the DSM-5, um, and it's, going, it's causing a lot of confusion for practitioners who don't have a lot of experience in this field because they tend to think of um, what we would classify before as, let's say, pervasive developmental disorder or high-functioning Asperger's kids are being, being pushed into the social pragmatic disorder category, and I'm not sure that's always right. Um, when you look at social pragmatic, it really should just be limited to children who have difficulty with pragmatic language, mm -hmm. um, which then automatically leads to some social delays. Nothing else. Right. And scripting, to me, is more of an autism type thing than social pragmatic disorder. So, I really do encourage you to follow up with the secondary uh, diagnosis and to make sure you have someone who has a background and experience in diagnosing autism or the ASDs in general because they will have a hard, easier time knowing which this is. That's incredibly important because then that will of course identify whether or not you get funding. Yeah. Um, so insurance does not cover any kind of intervention for social pragmatic disorder whereas it does for if it's an ASD. So um, hopefully you get the right diagnosis. In terms of the intervention, uh, WEEP is um, a very ba core ABA program. Can I tell you, she of wrote course. and said he does movie talk the most. Yes, movie talk. So movie talk to me is not social pragmatic disorder. Movie talk is much more of a basic problem. It is much more within the ASDs. So it could be an Asperger's type ASD, but it is more of an ASD type thing. So it'd be important to get a correct diagnosis or a second opinion. And then of course, we, we, you should follow the second opinion. If you get a difference, if you get an ASD diagnosis, you, know, you might um, then wanna go see another professional. But since things take a long time, I would tend to, go towards the more severe diagnosis because that will get you more uh, treatment and intervention and there's no harm in that. Right. It's better to get more, do more right now than do less. Now, uh, in terms of the actual treatment, so WEEP was one of the original LOVAS sites, so it has to be relatively good. I don't know about the people at WEEP right now. I can't comment on who's doing what there, but it will be based on the basic LOVAS discrete trial methodology. If you, when you interview with them, make sure that you find out if they do a little bit of cognitive behavioral intervention. Now, if you ask a behavior analyst, do you do some cognitive behavioral intervention, they'll freak out and say, of course not. But just look at their programming and ask, what would, ask them what they would do with an individual who's extremely high functioning. Mm -hmm. Because you also don't want a program that's going to be like rote discrete trial memorization stuff, that's not what your child needs. Your child does really need more of an advanced type of intervention that focuses on uh, thinking things through the right way and not just memorizing things. Right. The Denver model um, has been very successful in a lot of different areas. I have seen the Denver model, I've seen it um, uh, kind of uh, you know sampled in front of me. I'm, I, it's too loose for my taste. I personally don't love the way things are done in the Denver model because I feel like it is, it doesn't have enough, um, I guess, uh, specific set hierarchies that the, that the interventionist has to go through. It's, uh, it does tend to do very well with uh, developing conversational speech. 
So, you know, I, I guess it's, it's a toss up between the two. And if I were you as a parent, I would really just go and ask a lot of questions. Don't be afraid to ask to see another family who's receiving these services. We often do this. If I have a family coming in that I would like to treat and they're not sure if they want to do this, I'll say, why don't you just go and observe one of our cases? Ask to see another family in both locations, both sites, and see um, who's going to be able to kind of make you feel like this is the right thing. Also, uh, no matter what, intensity will matter for your child. So if uh, one of these organizations says, oh, we can do this in just eight hours a week, and the other one says, no, we need at least 25, go with the one that's recommending intensity because they're taking this more seriously. Uh, I know there's often problems with um, to, when one parent doesn't agree with the other parent and just doesn't see the deficits, uh, perhaps because they're not around enough. I would suggest that you uh, have your husband engage in some uh, individual activities with your child, like going out together and it, just give them enough alone time so that your husband can kind of also experience some of these uh, deficits that you're seeing. That's so important. When A lot of times when one parent becomes the autism or the difficulty uh, captain, the yeah. program director yeah. is what we refer or, to it as. Or well. the <laughs> right. director of the kids. You know, exactly. Right? Um, we feel like we have to control everything. Right. And, and so the other person doesn't get all the information that they need to get in order to. And, exactly. And we have to step back. So I appreciate that advice. Um, they, in the meantime, while she's waiting, what's the best way she can approach the movie talk? The movie talk, you know, it's one of those difficult things. I would not uh, engage in it. I wouldn't respond to it. I would, uh, when it occurs, and it's, I have to really see the scenario that it's occurring in. Because sometimes uh, what we hear in movies, we do use and it is appropriate. The only reason that it stands out is that we don't introduce it. So there's two different scenarios here. He, he's either hearing something from movies and then he's throwing it out there out of context and it doesn't fit right. into what's actually occurring right now. If that's the case, then you just basically you need to give him appropriate language to, that would replace it. So you don't, you don't necessarily have to say, no, we don't say that. You just correct and have him model what it is he should say in that scenario. If, however, his movie talk does fit, in other words, it's relevant to the concept that's going on or the subject that's going on, then you give an introduction. You teach him to introduce it. So, for instance, a lot of times kids will say, um, oh, last night I saw uh, the TV show, blah, 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 and, blah, 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 and then they'll say, and he said, this is and if they didn't say that whole section about introducing, oh, last night I saw that, and somebody, a character in there said, and they just said the script, it would seem very odd. Right. So what they do is they introduce it. Now think to yourself, when he does movie talk, is it appropriate if he gave an introduction? Oh, that's a good question. And if he gave, gives, if that's the case, then teach him the introduction. Have have a behaviorist teach him now. I'm glad that you asked that question because the Denver model won't do that. Mm -hmm. The ABA program will do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you're questioning which one to go to, you really kind of need to think about uh, the, the actual core deficit. Is he just using some, that I, I hesitate to give too much guidance on what to do with the movie talk because sometimes our kids use movie talk as a form of communication. They're trying to interact. Um, you know, you said he doesn't have other conversational speech. This is his conversational right. speech. He's trying to converse, uh, and perhaps he just doesn't realize that he can't use it, or he's not using it appropriately. So it's like the people when we get on the elevator that they don't know what else to say, so they go, it's really cold today. It's that very kind of similar thing. to that, absolutely. And if you thought about, if you think about it, it might be appropriate when, you know, there's subtle cues in our social environment, like a, a elevator is a great example. You're standing in an elevator with complete strangers and someone will say, oh, it's very cold today. It's freezing out there, right? Yeah. Now, if you were walking down the street and the other person was walking against you as, and as you passed each other, the person said, it's freezing today, you'd think that's very <laughs> odd. Yes. Right? So very, very subtle cues in our environment make something appropriate or not appropriate. 
And when you really look at kids doing movie talk, a lot of times you have to ask yourself, how does it, what about this could be corrected so that it is appropriate? Okay. All right. Let us know if that is helpful to you and what you, and what you do. Um, and so. We want to address, first of all, that the parent that we were just talking to wrote back and said he sings a lot, too, when something reminds him of a song. Like a Christmas tree, he sings jingle bells. Right. So, again, we're getting much, much more into the autism realm now. Yeah. Just that type of behavior. So that's not social pragmatic disorder. So, what, so you know, it occurred to me that obviously you could teach him to introduce the subject and say something like, oh, that reminded me of this song, and then he could sing the song, which would make the scenario a little bit more appropriate, but not necessarily always appropriate. So another thing would be important is that uh, you should try to teach him uh, the subject of the current situation. So at any given time, if he does something appropriate, if, you can, if he does something out of context, you know, sing something or say something that's movie talk, either you can try to give it an introduction so that it fits in better or you can just say what are we talking what's the subject right now what are we doing right now what are we talking about right now and then actually have him write down like no we're you know we're looking at trees or we're talking about whatever and have him help this is a very very difficult task for our kids which is to kind of give a title um, to the situation that mm -hmm. they're in um, th I can think of like five lessons right now that would really help him because there, you would have to basically teach him, like for instance, you know, we're in a studio right now. Mm -hmm. And so I would start with where are we? And then what I would have had to teach the child before that is what I, the behavior that's appropriate to a studio. Mm -hmm. You know, we only speak when we're, when we're on air, we're polite, we're quiet, we don't scream, you know, yeah. all the things that have to do like in a library or in a school setting or in the car or the, th the subject, what is the subject yes. we're talking about? That's a very hard task for our kids. It's a lesson that we teach. It would be very imp uh, important for him, for your child to learn the subject that is being discussed right then and there, and then whether or not the comment he made fits with that subject. But in order for him to do that, there's like three previous lessons that he'd have to do. So, but these are lessons that are available in skills. And skills, yes. So yes. skillsforautism.com. And I would actually go to, if you go on skillsforautism.com, you should go to the, and sign up, you can get everything you need in just one month. Go to the uh, social curriculum and look under um, social communication. That's the area that you really want to look at, and that's a lot of teaching children how to do conversational skills. Okay, great. Check that out, skillsforautism.com. Okay, moving on. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Mrs. Shannon and Dr. Doreen. I live in New Jersey and being on this road for two years and a few months. My son is five and a half now. He had some early intervention, had speech and other, now attends an ABA autism school and just started ABA therapy at home and ND still, but we don't know what ND is. Mm -hmm. uh, with all of this, I feel like he's not where he could be if the therapist were better. He's considered high functioning, has pretty long vocabulary and still is so delayed in social skills in conversation, I feel like there's no good therapist anywhere in New Jersey. We just got a new therapist two weeks ago and she's so not prepared. <coughs> Excuse me. She lets my son take over the section and looks lost at times. I already don't like her work and I'm planning on calling the office to request for a new therapist, but fear that the other one will be just as inexperienced as this one. <coughs> Excuse me. Last year we were uh, with a different provider. The same thing happened. Both therapists he had were inexperienced. <laughs> I'm I'll read it. I'll read. Do you have a drink of water? Um, I feel so lost, tired, and depressed. I know could, we could be doing so much better with the right therapists. Uh, please help me. I feel like I'm in the end of my rope. I just need some guidance um, to what I can do to find a better therapist or something else that can help my son. I wish I lived in California near a card office or be able to go to the offices in New York here. The three of them are more than an hour away and have no vehicle. My husband works and takes the car. Please, any help I appreciate on the phone. And yeah. she gave us our yeah. phone. <coughs> and thank you. Uh, she also, God bless, and thank you very much for that. Um, I, I, it's so difficult when our kids are not getting the right help, and I completely understand what you're saying. Um, I guess there's a few, other, few things you could do. You could 
take the existing therapists and try to help them become better. Uh, they, you could do that. This is the holiday season. I always, um, this was an idea that Shannon actually gave me many years ago. And uh, if you go on IBT's website, mm -hmm. Institute for Behavioral Training, their website is ibehavioraltraining.com. Mm -hmm. um, they have modules for training that are pretty inexpensive, like $7, $9, whatever. And you could purchase that module for your therapist and give it to them as a gift for Christmas. Um, I would suggest you teach you you get some modules that are on the more higher functioning, how to deal with higher <clears throat> functioning individuals, because from what I read, your child is at the higher level programming. So that's one way to go, um, just to help their techniques brush up. Another way is, I mean, and I know you sound very exhausted, and I totally understand, and I don't blame you at all, but. I think the solution, you know, if you can't find a provider who can give you the right therapists, the solution is to just hire some therapists and train them. Now that goes to, I don't know if you're getting funded, if you have insurance funding or state funding and it has to go through a provider, then I'm afraid you'll just have to keep looking. CARD does service families in New Jersey. I would really recommend mm -hmm. that you reach out to the Larchmont office and talk to them, that's the larger office there, and they have staff, I know we have staff who do serve children in New Jersey. I'm not sure if it's where you are, but I would definitely recommend talking to our Larchmont office. I think the more important thing is though that you just need to have, it's not necessarily the, you definitely don't want therapists who are being uh, manipulated by your child who are kind of <clears throat> following his lead. You don't want that. The therapist needs to be in charge and know what they're doing. But it's also, so you can get them trained, but it's also the content that's important. Like the therapists need to know how to teach your child these high level things like socializing appropriately, conversing, using his vocabulary to actually have full conversations and all that sort of stuff. So. It just is really important to get a good program in place. We've had success with families where um, it's all what we used to call workshop model, which is essentially all therapists who are local, uh, hired by the family, and we do the oversight supervision and training. So any kind of thing that like that we can try to help you with, I would start by talking to the Larchmont office. Um, the, the operations manager in Larchmont can give you some guidance. Obviously, if you can talk to one of the supervisors in Larchmont, they can give you a lot of guidance. But the basic concept is just to try to get experienced people in there. And I'm really sorry. It's very hard to do that, I know. It is hard. But I'm going to say this. Thanks to you, we have the tools to do whatever we need to do. I hope so, yeah. There, there, is, there are toolkits that are available to you because you can do the trainings you can do uh, all with IBT. Yeah. And, you can, and you can give those to your therapist and you can train them. You've got skills. Yes. It really has to do with how much, you know, I hate it when parents are burnt out to the point where when they come to us, they're just done. I, it's like I, if you have the energy or if you have a family member who has the energy who can help you, you can do all of this. You can hire therapists. You can train them. IBT's website is fantastic. It'll train any therapist to become all the way up to a supervisor level. So you can get a lot of training there. And, and you as a parent should also, I mean, the best cases are where the parent is able to oversee the program and, and tell the staff what to do next or help the supervisors what they choose next. And then skills, as Shannon said, really gives you the entire curriculum and content no matter what your child's functioning is because it starts with a very detailed assessment and then links to exactly what your child needs to be taught how they need to be taught, the lesson plan, the goals, the objectives, the step-by-step, -step, everything. It really is comprehensive. And if there are behaviors, it also tells you how to deal with those. Yeah. It's just a matter of getting someone in there who has the energy right now to just help you organize the whole thing.